I am John Miller from a company called NJ. Um, we are a debt management and a claims management company and today I'm just going to concentrate on the claims management side because otherwise it gets too complicated and it gets too busy. So once those go around, <coughs> as you know the payment protection insurance side of the business is basically helping people claim back their PPI which is an insurance product sold to um, run alongside credit cards, loans, secured loans, unsecured loans, mortgages, car finance, any, any sort of finance had an insurance policy. The idea of it was to protect the customer from um, should they be ill or unable to work through redundancy or um, accident or sickness. The problem with it was that most of the insurances were sold to people either they were unaware that they had that and it was added to the loan as an add-on without the advice being given or that part of that insurance you was unable to claim against, i.e. if you had an existing illness and you try to make a claim, it was void. If you were self-employed, you don't make yourself redundant. So a third of that insurance policy that you're paying for, you can't claim against. They estimated that by about 2008, there was 20 million policies that had been sold to various people around the country. Um, and there was probably another seven, eight million in process when all this claims process came to light. Um, the idea being was that the the Financial Ombuds Services Act, the people that control it, decided that the bank should write to the customer to tell them that there was a potential claim. Hands up all those that got a letter. Exactly. Um, the bank said they were looking into it, but it wasn't the case. They may have sent letters out to some people, but they were only dealing with existing cases and not the cases that had been paid off or clients had renewed and moved away. So obviously the claim industry started. So various companies were writing to people or contacting them as you get all your phone calls every day, press one for this, two for that, three for your claim. No one knows how much you're entitled to until the claim goes in. Um, what happens is obviously it gets swamped, but how we work is we are refer we get referred leads, we don't advertise it as such other than a website. Um, we get the information from the client. Most people do not know if they've had it. The, way, the easiest way to look at it is on your credit card statements as a credit card or your loan documents, which is what I'm sending around here now. Um, what the banks do is exactly what you ask them to do. For example, if you write to them and say, can you look at this account number, they will look at that account number. They may not look at the previous four or five that you've had because you haven't asked that question. Now, if you see the first one that's coming around was um, an offer Lloyd's made to a client if you look at the list, the first ones have all got a value against them because there was PPI taken. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The last one says no PPI. Yeah. Blank. If we if we'd have written to lawyers to, with that just one account number, we'd have got a no back. But what we do is ask the bank to look at anything that's related to the initial loan done previously. Hence the reason that that ended up being reviewed and the offer came back for that amount of money. Okay? So... The bank will do what you ask them and no more. Luckily we had an account number, but we asked them to review the whole lot. In some cases, clients haven't got an account number. So we have to write with the addresses, details, dates of birth of their previous addresses over the last period of years. And the banks will then try and find the information. If the account's more than six years old and it's been paid off, the bank won't necessarily have the information. They'll write back to you say, it's, we, under the regulations, we don't have to keep the information. It's more than six years old, so we've got rid of it. So the onus is on us and yourselves to provide the information. They'll still let you make the claim, but you've then got to provide the information to support your claim. So that's where the problems lie. You get the company saying that we can go back to 1984, 1876. But realistically, <clears throat> if, if you've paid this thing off more than six years ago, you're going to have to prove it to the banks that one, you've taken it, and the reasons why we're making the claim, which is exactly what we do. now. By all means, you can do this this yourself, and there are ways of doing that, and that you can download the paperwork. But people get intimidated by the banks. They're frightened to ask questions, and they're frightened for people to then ring them back and question them. That's why the claims management company started. And obviously, like anything, good and bad claims management companies, and it's about building relationships with people. We hopefully do it the right way, and build a relationship and ask the right questions. Um, it seems to be working for us, and we've like anything, it's, it's gauged on success. But if you've got the right information and the right reasons for the claims, invariably you'll, you'll get your claim. Basically, you're getting your money back plus 8%. It's not a new, fresh load of money that you've suddenly brought out of nowhere. It's what you've paid plus 8% is the, um, the, initial, the additional amount that the government says they've got to have. 
And obviously what this has led to <coughs> is a bit of a claims culture because the banks are suddenly being found out on lots of other things that they've done with regards to all this stuff. How many of you um, had the CPP insurance against cards being lost stolen and have had a letter from CPP saying if you'd like to make a claim, fill the form in and send it back? Because the CPP card cover protected you from cards being lost, stolen or cloned, but you already get that cover with a card when you take it out. So they were selling the product that they already covered you for for free. Yeah, there's another one at the moment going around called Sentinel. That's exactly the same thing, and they'll be writing to you. Though those companies will write to you, that's not a claim you've got to make. The next claim that's coming along now, fixed fee bank charges. Yeah. Who's got a bank charge where they pay a fixed amount every month to gives them an overdraft, gives them uh, mobile telephone coverage, free holiday insurance, car yeah. breakdown. Yeah. yeah. Yeah? How many of you use it? I've used it. You've used it. You've used it. Most people, one, don't remember ever being sold it, take their mobile phone insurance out the mobile phone company they use, and how do you, if you've used your holiday insurance, when it's sold to you, do I, you qualify? I decided to upgrade my account yeah. with Nationwide to this Flex Plus account. Sure. And they told me what I would get for that. And to be fair, my wife's car broke down in one for one day, and I phoned them up and they've gone and collected it all today. So you, me, yeah, no, okay. you are one of the lucky ones. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, if you know you've got that policies and you understand what you've got, then it's fine. But most people aren't unaware that they've got those additional policies because it's something that's said to you when you take fill the form and oh, by the way, you get a tele telephone cover. But also, the people that are selling it to you are not, haven't got the knowledge. They're not authorised. Authorised to do it, that's the word, not authorised. The reason being is, if, you t if they've given you a holiday cover and you've had an existing illness, you might not be covered. Well, that's incumbent on you. Again, I had the same thing. I had to phone up about my holiday cover. And because I was going to France on a motorbike, they said, no, we don't cover you. I said, well, if I hadn't phoned you, how would I know? It's not in your term. Exactly. So the biggest, that is, uh, talking to the uh, financial officer, and that at the moment is now the claims that's taken over from PPI as the biggest claim issue. Because people aren't aware of the extra products, and you're paying for something that you're never going to actually use. And you can't have two policies running for the same thing. You can't have two mobile phone policies or two holiday insurances and you forget you tend to forget that you've got these things and the way the financial wisdom works is having the documents isn't enough for you to say that you're aware of what you've got the people have to tell you and to explain to you how it works so you've got the PPI which is still running and they estimate that there's five million people still out there entitled to do the claim that have never bothered you've got the CPP which probably has been finished now most people have had that information sent to them Sentinel, which is the other one, which is similar to CPPP. You've got the bank accounts, and then you move on to the next big thing, which is the commercial mis-selling. Now, on that second page that I've given you, that is a loan document that we're dealing with at the moment. <coughs> and if you look at it there, at the top, I think the total amount is um, seven and a half million, the loan for seven and a half million, if you had those bits and pieces up. Okay, they've asked us to look at that, because that was a loan issued by one of the banks. And if you turn to page two at the top, they've got two rates, a cap rate and a collar rate, okay, which is basically the most the insured the loan could go to interest rate wise, and the minimum it will be. You see that? Yeah. Okay. Now you think, okay, that's fine. That that company will pay for that facility. The problem is that rate, those rates are above <coughs> the LIBOR rate, which is the inter interbank lending rate, what the banks will lend each other when they're taking out loans. But the banks fix the rate to be lower. Mm -hmm. So you're paying for an insurance basis to stop the rates going between those figures that you're never going to claim because the rate was already going to be remained low. Okay? And the other thing that is that fixed rate was higher than the variable rate because obviously the way we are at the moment, the rates have been low for five or six years. The banks know this. They've charged you for something you're never going to complain, uh, never going to claim on because they've fixed the rate. Now that's probably going to end up being about two million pound claim. And that's a little one. I was just saying to Rob earlier, we were looking at one for about 14 million. Now, when bank companies are this big, the loan sizes are massive, obviously, but what their banks have done wrong in some cases is the same whether it's 50p or 50 million pound. It doesn't make any difference. The process is wrong. Um, they reckon that's gonna be, in a volume of money, five times bigger than PPI because of the volume of volumes alone. So you, the problem with that is obviously no one now trusts the bank to do anything right. They're trying to clean themselves up, but everything's coming through mm -hmm. and, the, and the banks are supposed to contact you. 
Now, they only contact you who tend to be the stuff that's liar. They never go back to the old stuff where they've renewed the loan, which is still badly sold. And that's the way things are with the banks. The other two things that are coming through at the moment as well are miss sale mortgages, where people have gone to brokers for their mortgages, but the brokers don't explain that they might only have be on a panel of 10 or 11 lenders and don't tell you that you could go to the whole market and get a choice. So what you think is the best deal is not necessarily the best deal that you could have had at the time, but there's that issue. And the same with overseas borrowing. People that have bought places in some for Cyprus, in Sterling, the bank have converted it to the Swiss franc, for example, which is the, and the rates have gone like that. So your £100,000 sterling mortgage is now 350000 because they try to take it to a, another a currency which has fell out of bed because the rates have changed. But the cost is put back to you, not by the bank. The bank don't take no responsibility for the action, even though you had no control on what they've done. So these are the things that are coming through. So you need to be aware and have a look. Obviously, from our point of view, we're happy to look at anything that you've got with no obligation until you sign a document so that you want us to act for you. And up to that point, it's free, free advice. So you need to be aware of these things. If you're not sure, get your paperwork together, come and have a conversation with me. That, in a nutshell, is how the claims industry is working, and they're the areas that we're looking into at the moment. But it's constantly moving, and the regulations are constantly changing. So if you're not sure about anything, come and see me. Thanks, Thanks. 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 I did see on the TV the other day, I mean, I've been saying for years, my industries have got a bunch of new rotics. All this, but they're now saying if you were sold a financial product by a bank, a financial advisor, on which you've lost money, you can make a claim. Now, how far is it going to go? I mean, people I deal with value, you know, you know, they say the value of your funds and fall as well as plummet, sorry, as well as rise. You know, and, and the warnings that we have to put out to people now before we can do any transaction. So you can see where the claims industry is going next. They've, they've gone through all of these things, and the next thing they want to do is just a chap sitting there on the TV, so we never had money before, we lost £24,000. Well, I'd like to know what warnings he had when he was taking that out in the first place. Yes, that's but they thought that we'll always find in the favour of the crime. That, I think what's happened is where the banks have been um, do, doing things the way they've it's tied everybody, so they should, well, you're all left guilty. The, that's why I left them. the bank, to be yeah. fair. I left the bank when I was 40 because I didn't like what they were asking us to go and do with their plans. So, any other questions? <coughs> any more questions? <coughs> can't have been that boring, surely. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. Yeah, yeah I was going to ask, um, when you, you made a statement before, you said whether it's written down or not, had they told you? Well, again, backing on to that, I mean, even in my industry, you know, you've got to be very clear what you're saying to people. Um, you know, at what point does that stop? Because you could say, well, they never told me that. Well, what point do you have? Was it recorded the conversation? I mean, it's written down. You know, to what point? And, and as Tony said, I think what's happened is because of the issues, mm -hmm. even if it was explained and there's no records, the, the governing bodies are going with the client because there's a there's a there's a sort of flow of things going wrong. The banks the banks were selling products that they weren't qualified to sell in various in, variably. Your staff member that used to sell bank accounts now was bank accounts insurance, life cover, accident sickness policies, telephone cover, all of these no one's ever talking properly. So how do they there's no way of gauging that they're qualified to do it. And that's the problem. Thanks John. Brilliant. Well done. Sir.